Aspiring surgeon Ladvenia Woodward met her boyfriend on Tinder. He should have swiped left. She swiped a bread knife and stabbed him in the leg in a drugged and drunken rage. How's that for tender love? Judge Pringle was so impressed by Woodward's carving skills, he decided to give her a pass on jail so that others could go under her knife as well. Would you like to go first? Picture the following. You are at a public bus stop. Two other people are there, person A and person B. Person A says something degrading and sexually explicit to a complete stranger, person B. Person B, shocked, offended, outraged, hauls off and slaps person A across the face, hard. Have you unconsciously assigned genders to the two people, male for A and female for B? If I told you A, whose words were so offensive, was female, and B, who experienced A's act of verbal abuse, was male, would you be less comfortable with the slap B dealt to A? Would you judge B for being offended, instead of A for being rude? In reality, what both individuals did in the situation was abusive and aggressive, but regardless of the sexes of those involved, with nothing more than words coming from person A, Person B's reaction was an unjustified and unnecessary escalation from rudeness to violence. Most men's advocates and activists, especially those whose focus is on issues surrounding intimate partner and sexual violence, already know the sex of the individual taking an action doesn't change its nature. But what about the rest of society? There are several videos on YouTube showing the general public's tendency to respond differently to violence depending on whether it's perpetrated by a man or a woman. The response to sexual violence is even more stark. When a woman accuses a man of sexual violence, the public doesn't even always wait for evidence before engaging in condemnation and often even aggression against the accused. When a man accuses a woman, he faces a range of unsympathetic reactions, including gay shaming being mocked as a wimp, being accused of lying, being treated as an invader of a female issue, and his experience being minimized in comparison to that of women. Of course, that's the perception of the unwashed masses, right? What about the more educated? There's clearly gender disparity here. Doesn't that make this a feminist issue? So, how have feminists addressed it? Not so well, actually. Rather than study violence as a dysfunctional human behavior which must be addressed with an eye toward prevention, feminist researchers and other academics sought to suppress evidence of female perpetration and emphasize or even exaggerate male perpetration. The methods used to achieve this have been exposed by numerous critics, including Eugene Kanan, a retired sociology professor from Purdue University quoted in October of 1993 by the Toledo Blade describing feminist sexual violence prevalence research as highly convoluted activism rather than social science. That article also included criticism by researcher Margaret Gordon of the University of Washington, who classified herself as a feminist but vehemently disagreed with the direction feminist-led sexual violence prevalence research was taking. She said, There was some pressure, at least I felt pressure, to have rape be as prevalent as possible. Gordon's study, which used direct questions and found that one in 50 women had been raped or sexually assaulted, was largely ignored by feminists in favor of higher prevalence findings. Berkeley social welfare professor Neil Gilbert set off protests at his university by publishing an article pointing out that bad methodology had led some feminists to exaggerate the rate of rape and other sexual violence. What had he dared to criticize? Researchers had used questions designed to ignore respondents' assessment of their own experiences and impose feminist beliefs instead, resulting in findings in which the researcher applied the label rape where three-quarters of their respondents did not, and nearly half had further relations with their supposed rapists. Christina Hoff Summers, also cited in the article, has made a career of criticizing feminism's approach to these issues. She tore apart the researcher whose method ultimately became the standard for feminist sexual violence prevalence research, Mary Koss, whose survey question template led the charge in writing feminist beliefs over women's experiences. It wasn't until the 21st century, however, that Koss was called out on the other egregious aspect of her design, defining rape to exclude female perpetrators who victimize men or boys by excluding victims who were forced to penetrate, also known as forcibly enveloped, by their attackers. 
Under Koss's definition, a female perpetrator who imposes herself on a male victim through coitus or fellatio is not labeled a rapist. Instead, the behavior gets dumped into other sexual assault, the same category as things like groping. How's that for minimizing an experience? They haven't done any better with intimate partner violence. Feminist researchers even have a label for female perpetrated partner assault against a male victim. Preemptive self-defense. But he was totally going to be asking for it eventually. The incredible bias in feminist-led partner violence research was best exposed by Murray Strauss in his report, Gender Symmetry and Partner Violence, Implications for Prevention and Treatment. Tom Golden provided a great summary of Strauss's revelations in his article, Strauss exposes the academic veils placed on domestic violence research. He pointed out that feminists use biased research, selective suppression of information, false framing, and outright lies to manipulate partner violence research findings. The question is, why the hell would they do that? Erin Pitsy, speaking publicly, has explained this numerous times. As she discovered when she founded the shelter movement, it is easy to get funding to assist the rescue and recovery of female victims of violent men, a fact second-wave feminists latched onto and capitalized on rather quickly. It is, however, damned near impossible to do the same for male victims of violent women, and not just when asking private donors. The official response to female violence is also dramatically different from the response to male violence. In their report, the help-seeking experiences of men who sustain intimate partner violence and overlooked population and implications for practice, Emily M. Douglas and Denise A. Hines disclosed that while family members and mental health care professionals can be supportive, police and victim services organizations are a different story. The researchers reported that male victims of female abusers faced bias and discrimination at every turn. Upon seeking abuse victims' agencies and hotline assistance, they were sometimes rebuffed with the explanation that the service was only for female victims, sometimes accused of lying and even of being perpetrators, sometimes ridiculed, and sometimes referred to batterer programs even if they weren't labeled abusers. Upon seeking police assistance, they faced the possibility of being ignored, ridiculed, or even arrested. The report went on to state, within the judicial system, some men who sustained intimate partner violence reported experiencing gender stereotyped treatment. Even with apparent corroborating evidence that their female partners were violent and that the help seekers were not, they reportedly lost custody of their children, were blocked from seeing their children, and were falsely accused by their partners of intimate partner violence and abusing their children. According to some, the burden of proof for male intimate partner violence victims may be especially high. On a side note, the National Organization for Women uses portrayal of fathers as abusers in their arguments against equally shared parenting laws. But according to statistics from the U.S. Health and Human Services Department, the majority of children abused by one parent have historically been abused by their mothers. Victims of female sexual violence don't necessarily fare any better than those of female partner violence, even when they are underage. Government-sponsored research, such as the Centers for Disease Control's National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, uses Mary Koss's female perpetrator excluding rape definition to avoid having to report the rate of rape perpetrated by women. The researchers don't even know why they're using that definition. The following is an excerpt from the phone call during which I found that out. Regarding the uh, male respondents reporting being faced, forced to penetrate, well, I didn't really give um, a very clear reason why that was treated differently than when a, a female is forcibly penetrated. Uh, do you have some explanation on that? The, I mean, the reports define the, the made-to-penetrate um, variable. Like, it's in the 2010 report as well. Um, there's a box that kind of describes how those variables were measured in this list. Well, it, what it does is it just basically says that that was excluded from the de definition of rape. Rape is, um, is there is a, there is a definition of rape, and it's a, a, a separate form of victimization than the made to penetrate. And it, if you look at the um, published reports, it defines, it shows how the rape was defined and how made to penetrate was defined. And these are also, um, 
in line <clears throat> with the um, CDC uniform, um, you know, definitions for sexual violence. And but what uh, was the criteria for deciding that being made to penetrate wasn't rape, whereas being forcibly penetrated was? As I said, they're, they describe um, how they were measured, and for more, you know, sort of background information uh, in the field on how um, the different definitions of rape and, you know, uh, actually we're the first survey to actually include this um, made to penetrate. Um, but you can sort of, there's experts and processes from all over the country going back several years in terms of trying to get, um, you know, ideas of how to uh, measure these constructs in surveys. And that's why we do go with, uh, you know, all the behaviorally intended, uh, behaviorally specific victimization um, questions. And, uh, you know, the, we measured several types of sexual violence victimization um, in, the, in, the sur in the survey based on those victimization, those very specific, there's like 60 different victimization <laughs> questions we asked. The team has responded to being alerted to this bias by ceasing to report the sex of respondents alleged perpetrators. In the court system, female perpetrators are not treated as harshly as male perpetrators. In separate studies, Sonia Starr, an assistant law professor at the University of Michigan, and Jill K. Donner, a Bowling Green State University student doing research for her doctoral thesis, found that convicted men receive much longer sentences than women convicted of the same crimes with the same basic details. Starr found similar disparity at every step of the process, from police response, where women are less likely to be arrested, to time served, where women are more likely to see rehabilitative therapies substituted for incarceration, and if incarcerated, to serve less of their sentences, already shorter than those imposed on men, before being released. Male victims of female rapists face an additional injustice that is unique to their sex. While female victims of a rape in which a child is conceived have adoption, abortion, and safe haven abandonment as means to avoid having parental responsibility imposed against their will as a result of the rape, fathers do not have the advantage of having physical custody at birth. A male rape victim whose rapist conceives a child with him during the crime faces the possibility that not only will his rapist have custody of his child from birth, she can use the child support system to extort money from him as long as she retains that custody, even if the father is underage, even if he is so far underage that he cannot legally earn the money to pay that debt. Ask Shane Sayer, forced to pay child support to his rapist after conceiving at the ripe old age of 13. Often, when men's issues activists discuss this information, the only response we get is bombardment with increasingly crappy excuses. Feminists blame their shoddy research methods on men's hesitance to report being victimized. Official responses to female perpetration are blamed on prevalent attitudes and beliefs about gender, which feminist advocates are quick to call symptoms of a patriarchal system. But who is stopping that system from modernizing its approach? Groups like the National Organization for Women actively promote some of the myths surrounding gender disparity in sentencing in conjunction with advocating lighter and alternative sentencing for only women. These same groups' advocacy led to the enactment of the Violence Against Women Act, which promotes Duluth's patriarchal dominance theory on partner violence and contains federal financial incentives for policies which promote mandatory arrest, prosecution, conviction, sentencing, and sentence enforcement all of which primarily affect accused men due to the use of that Duluth model. The result? At every turn, social, institutional, and legal barriers hinder victims of female perpetrators of violence who seek support, escape, protection, and justice. This has led to an environment which perpetuates cycles of violence rather than providing a means to end them. It endangers both sexes. Research shows that female-initiated intimate partner and sexual violence either directly or indirectly contributes significantly to harm experienced by both sexes. This indicates that at every level, from the personal to the institutional, 
Eliminating society's blind spot toward female violence could go a long way toward reducing the overall incidence of intimate partner and sexual violence. In fact, it may be fair to say the biggest hurdle between anti-violence activists from all facets of the political spectrum and potential success in their efforts is that bias. together with Karen Strawn and the adorable specter of death, Prim Reaper, to rip the bandage off of, of society's blind spot, female violence. At my crisis hotline, we have training for the new volunteers that involves a classroom portion and a role play portion in which leadership volunteers, which is what I am currently, help facilitate fake calls so that new people can get used to what the general structure of a call looks like. Lately, I've been doing role plays for the domestic violence section of the role plays. So usually I'm responsible for about three to four new volunteers and I'm always careful to tell them that I, I always try to make equal opportunity scenarios um, like such as discussing female victims, male victims, um, hetero and hetero homosexual domestic violence situations where either one or both parties are perpetuating violence. I've had so many new volunteers tell me Oh, I never considered the possibility of these kinds of things happening when discussing mutual violence, especially between lesbian couples, despite this being one of the most common domestic violence scenarios. And I even get people being hesitant to act out calls in which a woman is the perpetrator of violence. Um, also, the role play section happens after the classroom portion, which I feel is an important thing to, to mention, because it means that these scenarios aren't really getting discussed in, in the classroom portion, at least not as much as the stereotypical scenario offered up. Um, now, I obviously can't ethically discuss details of any real calls, but let me assure you that we do get calls just like the examples that I talked about. And even when these calls come up and we present the information to our supervisors, they often still react with surprise when they hear about female perpetrators of violence. Um, I have mentioned this to the training coordinator that these scenarios should be presented more often in training because as people who are regularly dealing with crisis situations, there's really no excuse for these scenarios to be eliciting surprise from people, especially when they're as common as they are. Um, I don't want to talk down about this service because I think that what we do is extremely important and we still do our best to help anyone who calls, but this is one area in which I think that we could stand to improve. One of the reasons why I got into the men's rights stuff was mm -hmm. because once I realized that this sort of idea of um, that if women are never violent, right? Never violent because they're angry, never violent because they're mean, never violent because they're abusive, never violent, be you know, if, if women are ever violent, it is self-defensive violence. And that's even when we're talking about when women initiate violence, right? It's, they are defending themselves from his anticipated violence, right? It's preemptive self-defense, right? Um, so when I realized that that was actually something that existed within the law and the policies surrounding domestic violence, and then I thought about the fact that I know more men who get, you know, at that point, I knew more men who had been beaten by their wives than the other way around, right? Yeah. That really, really, really struck me. And the whole idea that me, you know, just a person who works in a kitchen, right, um, as, as a cook, knew more men who had been physically attacked by their wives, who had been physically attacked with a weapon by their wives, who had been beaten up by their wives, who had come into work covered in bruises and scratches, thanks to their wife, right? And at that point, I had only ever known women who had dealt with um, verbal abuse, psychological abuse, and stuff from their men that, that, you know, when I ask them, are you okay? You know, does he ever hit you? They're like, no, 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 nothing like that. He's just controlling or he just, you know, he's just jealous. Right. But he's, he's never laid a finger on me. Um, 
you know, like, how are people not seeing that this is going on? Um, the the only the only thing I can think of is that they're not seeing it because they don't. It's something that they will not see. Just a few years ago, there was a woman here in the in the Dayton metro area who microwaved her baby. Um, oh my God! What the and fuck? The 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 horror of it was she she just she just did it and afterwards the best excuse that she could come up with the absolute most stellar defense that she could come up with in court was that she couldn't have done it because she was too drunk and uh she tried to blame her son and um, for, for 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 having having microwaved and of how, course how, the baby how, did die how old um, was her son that she tried this was to blame. this was an elementary school kid she tried oh to blame. Oh my fucking god. And this like this actually was it was a, a, a huge controversy in the area because there were people who of course you can't hurt a baby without people recognizing its violence. There will even if there are a lot of people who um dismiss female violence when a baby is the one that gets hurt and a child is, is getting blamed for it, and alcohol is your only excuse, there starts, it starts to build up, you know, um, to, to, to where there's at least a segment of the population that will not dismiss it. And then there were people, there were people trying to excuse, what oh, the... it was an alcohol problem, this is oh. a tragedy, this poor okay, okay. Woman I'm, lost I'm her gonna... baby, blah, blah, I'm... blah. And oh, my... It, oh my God, you cannot imagine how angry the rest of us got that could see this is a violent act. This was a okay. torturous death for an infant. You know, you know, you know what I'm going to, you know what I'm going to do? Okay. I am going to say... Um, and I'm going to say something like controversial, controversial here. I'm going to say something, you know, okay, if, if you have to fucking kill your baby, if that is something that your, your entire being is telling you, you must do. What the fuck? The microwave. I had to kill my dog. I had to do that with my own hands. And I figured out a way to do it humanely. Right? I didn't fucking stick my dog in the microwave or back over it eight times with a car or strangle it with a pair of fucking panties and throw it over the fence. No, I did it in a humane fucking way. Like, that's yeah. not just killing a baby. That is torturing, torturing. a fucking... Oh! Yeah. Oh! <laughs> this, is, this is not the only one. There's been other recent news stories that have been just absolutely evil like that. And, and of course... We, we hear about these things, and every time, you know, we are shocked. And, and it is shocking. That degree of violence, that degree of cruelty is always shocking. It's, it's shocking no matter who does it. But, but, but people I always I seem to be more surprised when they find out that it was done by a woman. Well, they find the truth it, is... They find it impossible to believe that a woman would be capable of that kind of cruelty. And I'm here to tell you that that's not the fucking case. That is absolutely not the fucking case. Women can be the meanest, cuntiest, most ruthless, high-flying bitches, right? That you have ever met. A woman will a woman will fucking ruin your life and then and gloat. Yeah. Oh gosh. Gloat. I, I can fact, tell you about gloating. She'll My... get pissed if it's not ruined after she's tried. <laughs> yeah. I tried to tell my dad one time about a bruise on my arm that appeared from you know who, and he he tried to accuse her of it, and she's like, "Oh well, she's obviously lying." And then after that, um, she's she's like, I, she was doing something, I I don't remember exactly what it was, but we were in the garage, and I was, and she said at one point, "Oh, you know, you just just." go try and tell your dad and he'll believe me and then and then what are you going to do after that and i just didn't even know what to say because i'm like a 10 year old kid so mm -hmm. what the hell am i going to do what bothers me the most about these cases of these horrific things is everybody can everybody can agree that men are capable of of doing that there are men 
not men are, but there are men who are capable of doing these really horrific, egregious, horrible, cruel things, right? And the moment that you suggest that there are women and, you know, possibly a similar number of women who are dysfunctional enough people, right, who've had the kind of upbringing, right, in a home with their brother who turned out that way, right, to, to be capable of doing these things. Everybody acts like you've grown a second head right? You've sprouted horns and webbed feet and, and you started quacking like a duck and you just, you just announced that the moon's made out of cheese. God right? forbid that you point out that women can be sociopaths and, and act that way or psychopaths and act that way even if they were brought up perfectly well. Well, not even yeah. trying to imply that this is a thing that's common to women, just even saying it, even yeah. just saying that women are capable of doing terrible things, just like everybody else, because surprise, they're human. People yeah. just lose their damn minds over it. Well, and, and then you have these these feminists who, you know, like Anita Sarkeesian, when, when I have to go online every day and defend my right to be human, right? And it's like, Okay, you know what? Do you know what a human is? It's a glorified fucking chimp with a better fucking all all body Brazilian wax. Well, on the right to be human, human is imperfect. We're not gods, we're not angels, we're not sculptures that somebody made that that they worked worked on and and until perfection and and preserved. We're animals. We are, we are living organisms. We make mistakes. We learn. We can have good ideas. We can have bad ideas. We can have good character. We can have bad character. We fuck up all the time. What if you have a situation like that where it's not abusive of the one partner to take control of the finances? I don't think it would be abusive of my friend to say, yeah, no, from now on, here, you get this amount of money every month, you can fucking blow it on porn, and the rest of it is under my control and it's going to bills, right? I don't think that's abusive, right? I don't think that, I actually think that the overspender, the compulsive gambler who's spending more money than the family can afford is being the abusive one. Well, and it, Society it's recognizes that when the overspender is a man, <laughs> they don't recognize it when the overspender is a woman. But mm -hmm. it's but you are correct. That is an abusive thing to do, and I've seen it happen mm -hmm. in numerous relationships. Um, and a lot of times, with uh, with women, it it takes their most ridiculous form of I saved so much money by buying this thing that I wouldn't have bought if it hadn't been on sale. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you didn't yeah. save money. You spent five hundred dollars. It doesn't matter if it would have cost three thousand to buy it new. We didn't have the five hundred. Yeah, you know? and mm -hmm. this is something that a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't get it. A lot of people don't understand that there are times when yeah, you have to take control of the finances. There is something that one, and, and I would agree, if, if, especially with boys, if, if you are a single mother or, you know, um, uh, if you do not have good support from the father of your child, like in terms of backing you up, um, if, you're, if your child is five years old and you have no control over them, right, what's going to happen when they're bigger than you, right? Um, if, if, if you do not have control of what goes on in your house as the parent, as the person who owns the house, right? W what, what happens when, when they're bigger than you? Um, but, um, I do want, I do want to reiterate that I do think that there, there are extremities of human experience where people can react with violence without having an abusive personality and without engaging in a pattern of abusive behavior. Um, that there are situations in which people will 
be pushed to an extent where they lash out violently. And that should be looked at as an act of violence, but should not be automatically categorized as abuse. And what I think part of the problem is in, in the intimate partner violence and family violence conversation is that it is all seen as abuse. So it, it really doesn't matter what other things are going on at the time, right? You're losing your house, you know, your mother-in-law is fucking visiting. Um, you, you just found out that your daughter is a crack addict and pregnant and turning tricks, right? Um, and, and your teenage son has just blown, he's just quit, hit, quit college and is blowing all of his money on, on freaking porn or something like that. Uh, Cause who would pay for porn? Um, you know, and, and your entire life is falling apart around you, right? And you got creditors knocking at your door and then your spouse, whether you're the man or the woman, your spouse starts something, yells something, maybe yells something that blames you, scapegoats you, lays everything on you, right? And you react in a violent way, right? first time you've ever laid a hand on your partner, right? Feel absolutely shitty and horrible about it the moment you've done it, right? That is not an abusive marriage. That is not an abusive relationship. That is, that is two people pushed into an extreme situation where something like that is likely to happen. And I just hate the fact that we take this sort of, and it's not just an approach through criminal law, because I think a lot of these cases could be addressed as particularly common couple violence and reciprocal violence should be addressed through a public health perspective rather than um, a criminal perspective, um, unless it's particularly egregious. But it's not just that we deal with those cases through criminal means but that we deal with them as if they are all evidence of abuse. As yeah, we, we to, apply a cookie cutter. Yeah, as opposed to, okay, what was happening? It's like Bill Burr said, you know, what was happening between these two people that they ended up here? Women are human, too. Every, humans are human, and they, they make mistakes. But we have to, to acknowledge that women are also human in the same way that men are human, and that everybody can make mistakes and learn from them. But unfortunately, they're, they're capable of violence just the same as anybody else. Yeah, and that's, that's one more reason why the most dangerous place for a woman to be, not to herself, but to everybody else, is up on a pedestal because the moment that she falls off you can damn well bet she's going to take somebody with her and with that i think we can uh, close out the show good night everybody we'll see you in the after show if you're a patron if you're not a patron www.patreon.com forward slash honey badger radio join us in the after show